Um, thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be with uh, uh, you here uh, this evening. Uh, back in 2010, when I retired from my uh, position as a professor of history at the State University of New York, Albany, I taught full-time at colleges and universities for uh, 43 years. During that time, I became increasingly aware of a number of trends affecting American higher education. These trends included the escalating income and power of university administrators, the crumbling status and livelihood of faculty and staff, soaring tuition for students, the replacement of liberal arts education with narrow vocational training, and in the context of growing corporate dominance of the United States, a slavish fawning upon big business. Shortly after retiring, I wrote the uh, satirical novel that uh, Jim Phillips um, uh, mentioned to you uh, about this uh, commercialization of higher education, titled, What's Going On at You Aardvark? Uh, I should just add here that um, my campus, the uh, State University of New York at, at Albany, uh, was renamed by the administration uh, as U Albany. So uh, U Aardvark was a, a, a play on that. Um, then, uh, when many readers reported that the zany work of fiction hit the mark, I began to research the overall issue more deeply. What I found through this research was that American colleges and universities really are becoming more and more like big businesses. Uh, let's consider how such businesses operate. For the most part, they seek to expand their enterprises, uh, reward their managers with lavish salaries, and enhance powers, maximize their revenues from consumers, minimize their expenditures by cutting labor costs, and focus their concerns upon commercial success. Let's take a look at these recent trends on American campuses uh, to see uh, to what degree this business model has been advancing. Uh, though American colleges were tiny and poorly funded at their founding, they have grown into vast economic enterprises today. Enrolling about 20 million students, the thousands of U.S. higher educational institutions are engaged in enormous economic operations. I do not know higher education's yearly income from student payments for uh, tuition, room, board, and assorted fees, or the revenue uh, provided uh, by subsidies from the federal government, states, and localities. Uh, but the total must be stupendous. Furthermore, colleges and universities are constantly increasing their endowments uh, through corporate investments. At the end of 2015, the market value of these endowment funds was $547 billion. In 2017, uh, the average annual return on the investments of the uh, 25 wealthiest colleges was over uh, 12%, uh, making them uh, $26 billion richer that year. Uh, today, Harvard University has an endowment of $36 billion, Yale uh, $27 billion, uh, the University of Texas System $27 billion. Stanford, $25 billion, Princeton, $24 billion, and, and so on. Uh, another way that modern colleges and universities have fueled their expansion is by becoming multinational ventures. As of late 2013, 52 U.S. universities operated 82 campuses in 37 foreign lands, slightly more than half of the world's overseas campuses. Uh, and uh, numerous other U.S.-operated campuses were being uh, developed overseas. Uh, according to a report in USA Today, this overseas <coughs> expansion reflected the, quote, increasing desire uh, among U.S. universities to internationalize their institutions and tap new revenue sources. Uh, therefore, we should not be startled to learn that the largest number of overseas campuses uh, American overseas campuses, uh, 35, uh, was located in a nation uh, with very few people but lots of money, the United Arab Emirates. 
To administer this vast and growing empire, American colleges and universities have employed a remarkable and ever-growing uh, number of administrators. Chancellors, presidents, vice presidents, associate vice presidents, assistant vice presidents, uh, provosts, associate provosts, deans, associate deans, uh, assistant deans, and a myriad of other campus officials. Between 1993 and 2009, the ranks of US campus administrators expanded to 230,000, a growth of uh, uh, 60 percent, 10 times the growth of the tenured faculty. From 1975 to 2008, the California State University system increased its number of administrators by 221 percent. By contrast, th that same university system's faculty expanded by only about 3 percent. It is also estimated that from 1987 to 2011-12, the number of administrators in the central offices of public university systems increased by 34 times. Alongside this growth in, in numbers is a, a substantial growth in the income of higher education's top managers. According to the Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, 58 private university and college presidents received more than uh, $1 million in pay during 2015, which is the last year um, uh, for which figures are available. Nearly 50% uh, more of, of them than the previous year. In fact, uh, 10 of them were paid between $2 million and uh, $4 million for that year. Although public college and university presidents whose income the uh, Chronicle made available for 2016-17 uh, didn't do as well as, as their private counterparts. Uh, Twelve of them did receive one million dollars or, or more for their services, and the highest paid uh, public university president received 4.3 million dollars uh, for that year. Furthermore, high-level managerial uh, positions often come with some very uh, substantial perks. At the University of Nebraska, top administrators were given free memberships in, in, in country clubs, as well as, as very expensive cars, uh, like the Porsche, uh, and driven by the chancellor of its medical center. At New York University, the uh, trustees gave President John Sexton, whose university compensation in, in uh, 2011 was $1.5 million, uh, a $1 million loan on, on top of that to help him, him purchase a vacation home on swanky Fire Island. Uh, according to a New York Times article, Gordon Gee, the Ohio State University president, who received university compensation in 2011-2012 uh, of, of $1.9 million, was known for, quote, uh, the lavish lifestyle his job supports including a rent-free mansion with an elevator, a pool, and a tennis court, and, and flights on private jets. Uh, these kind of perks, of perks are not unusual in higher education. More than 60% of university and college presidents get all or part of their housing provided by their institutions. More than 70% of them get a car or a car allowance, and more than a third get free memberships in private clubs. Uh, substantial but smaller uh, percentages of other top ad administrators, uh, ad administrators also receive cars, free housing or housing allowances, and payments for club dues. Top campus administrators increasingly combine their substantial income and lavish lifestyles with considerable power. In 2012, uh, Shirley Jackson, the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, uh, received $7 million from that institution, as well as a large mansion, first class air travel, and a, a, a chauffeured luxury car to uh, transport her around her campus. Thanks to the fact that Jackson also served on, on at least five corporate boards, including those of Marathon Oil and IBM, she uh, supplemented this income with more than a million dollars uh, per year 
from these sources. Uh, it seems that Jackson ran, and still runs, uh, she's still in office, uh, a very tight ship on her campus, where she abolished the faculty senate, and uh, smashed union organizing drives among downtrodden campus janitors and, and cafeteria workers. Uh, according to the Chronicle of Higher Education, she has a series of rules that are clear to everyone. These include, first, cabinet members must all rise when she enters the room. Two, only she is authorized to, to uh, set the temperature in conference rooms. <laughs> Three, if food is served at a meeting, vice presidents clear her plate. And four, she is always to be publicly introduced as the Honorable Shirley Ann Jackson. Falling into rages on occasion, uh, she publicly abuses her staff and frequently remarks, quote, you know I could fire you all. In a 2011 RPI Student Senate passed a resolution uh, criticizing her, quote, uh, abrasive style, top-down leadership, and the climate of, of fear uh, she had instilled uh, among administrators and staff. It even called upon RPI's Board of Trustees to consider Jackson's removal from office. But, as in the case of her abolition of faculty governance, the Board rallied to her defense. Now, it's, it's, possible, it's possible, of course, that these very well-paid, powerful university presidents deserve their privileges because they are, are providing the very best higher education in the nation. Uh, one way to test this hypothesis is to look at the highest paid presidents and compare their schools to the 2018 ranking done uh, by US News and World Report of America's best colleges and universities. So uh, let us do that with uh, some of the best paid among private university presidents. Uh, Nathan Hatch of Wake Forest University paid $4 million, school rank 27th. James Wagner of Emory University paid $3.5 million. This is per year, of course. Uh, a school rank tied for 21st. Uh, Max Nikias of the University of Southern California paid uh, $3.2 million, school rank tied for 21st. Daniel Curran of the University of, of Dayton paid $2.4 million, school rank tied for 124th. Uh, conversely, at the two highest ranked universities, highest ranked by uh, US News and World Report at least, uh, Princeton ranked number one, and Harvard ranked, uh, uh, Harvard ranked number two, the pay of, the, of, the, of their presidents stood at 63rd and tied for uh, 21st among their counterparts. Uh, much the same disjuncture between managerial pay and the quality of education is, through, is true for public college and university presidents. The highest paid uh, public college president, uh, James Ramsey of the University of Louisville, uh, received uh, $4.3 million. His school was in a tie for 165th place. After him came Jay Gobe of Auburn University, who received $1.8 million, his school tied for 103rd place. And the third highest compensation went to William McRaven of the U University of Texas system with $1.5 million. Uh, the ranking of the University of Texas schools, and there are numerous ones, varied, uh, but the highest ranking among them tied for 56th place. Uh, there are other measures of managerial quality as well. At, at NYU, after the faculty voted no confidence in uh, President Sexton's leadership, the uh, trustees convinced him to retire at the end of his contract in, in 2016. At Ohio State, uh, Gordon Gee, uh, the university president, you recall, whose compensation in 2011-12 in stood at $1.9 million, uh, subsequently retired in disgrace thanks to a, a public furor over his anti-Catholic remarks. At Penn State, where President Graham Spanier was the highest paid public university president in, in the country, 
in 2011-2012, uh, uh, receiving $2.9 million that year. He was dismissed and more recently convicted of child endangerment in, in connection with the crimes of his former assistant football coach, Jerry Sandusky, who was convicted in 2012 on uh, 45 counts of uh, sexual abuse of children. On other campuses, top administrators have been convicted of extensive fraud um, and embezzlement. Of course, someone has to pay for the privileged lives of top managers, uh, and one group that has done so is composed of the consumers of higher education, the students. Between 1978 and 2013, American college uh, tuition uh, reportedly rose by 1,120% and, and became the major source of revenue for higher education. Uh, traditionally, most public colleges and universities had no tuition or very low tuition, but faced with severe cutbacks in government funding from uh, conservative state legisla legislatures, these public schools uh, adopted a tuition system or a dramatically raised tuition. Today at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, which like the rest of the University of, of California system, was tuition free until the 1980s, the total yearly cost for a tuition, room, board, books, and other items for an in-state student is, is now $36,015. And for an out-of-state student, $64,029. That's per year, of course. Um, at the State University of New York, Albany, my campus, uh, which, like the rest of the SUNY system, was tuition-free until 1963, the total annual cost for an in-state student is $26,490, and for an out-of-state student, uh, about $43,000 per year. The, the, the costs at private colleges are even higher, of course. Uh, to a, uh, today, Harvard College estimates that the total annual expenses for its students is $67,580. According to my own undergraduate alma mater at Columbia College, its annual cost for students has now climbed to $74,173. I certainly couldn't have gone to uh, school when I did there if uh, tuition was anywhere near that amount. In fact, at that time, at my, I, I vaguely uh, recall uh, tuition was um, $900 per uh, semester. Um, now, now, of course, I, I was referring to uh, tuition, room, board, and so on, but not, nonetheless, uh, tuition has been soaring, as have the other costs. Um, this huge hike in, in the cost of a college education has had a, a devastating effect upon educational opportunity. Unable to afford college, many young people never attend it or uh, drop out along the way. Studies have found that the primary reason young people cite for not attending college is its enormous cost. Uh, many other young people can afford to attend college only by working simultaneously at paying jobs, which of course takes time away from their studies, and or by running up enormous debt. It is estimated that three out of four recent college graduates have borrowed to cover their college costs, uh, running up a debt averaging nearly $40,000 each. Consequently, American student loan debt now totals $1.5 trillion. Coping with this enormous debt, plus substantial interest, <coughs> constitutes a very heavy burden for the 44 million Americans who now bear it. All too many of them either default on it or give up on their dreams for post-college careers and settle reluctantly for working at jobs they dislike to pay it off. Uh, another way that the managers of American colleges and universities keep their eye on the bottom line is by cutting their labor costs. Oh yes, there, there are still some faculty members, tenured uh, or on lines uh, potentially leading to tenure, who receive comfortable middle class salaries. But most faculty do not. These underpaid educators are, are the adjunct 
and other contingent faculty, who by 2015 comprise 76% of the 1.2 million in instructional higher education appointments uh, in the United States. 76% of the faculty today uh, is e either adjunct or contingent, meaning there's no job security uh, whatsoever. Um, nor is there any uh, prospect of, of getting tenure, because they're not on tenure lines or lines leading to tenure. Um, despite what are often advanced degrees, scholarly research experience, and, and teaching uh, credentials, adjuncts are usually employed for only a, a few thousand dollars per course. Even when they manage to cobble together enough courses to constitute a, a, a full-time teaching load, that usually adds up to an income, leaving them below the poverty level. In 2015, NBC News estimated that families of, of 100,000 part-time faculty were it, enrolled in public assistance programs. Uh, uh, many of them apply for and receive food stamps. At the City University of New York, one of the largest public university systems in the United States, located in a metropolitan area with one of the highest costs of living, starting pay for an adjunct teaching a, a, a three-credit course is today little more than $3,000. Uh, May Eng, an adjunct uh, uh, teaching math at LaGuardia Community College and at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, uh, recently uh, remarked that uh, she visited, quote, the, the food pantry uh, quite often, and whatever I don't use, I pass on to the other adjuncts. Um, she added, quote, I, I have to wonder, is this really a way of life? Thanks to, thanks to the desire of campus administrators to maintain maximum flexibility in their employment practices, adjunct faculty face other job-related difficulties as well. Lacking employment security of any kind, they can be hired to, to uh, teach courses uh, the, the day before classes begin, or for that matter, not hired at all. Um, they often receive no health care or other benefits, have no office space, mailboxes or email addresses at, at colleges where they teach, and drive long distances between their jobs at different institutions. Uh, some reportedly live in their cars. If John Steinbeck were writing The Grapes of Wrath today, he might substitute adjunct faculty for impoverished uh, migrant farm laborers. Of course, the, the student body, which is paying much more for its education than any time in the past, is being provided with much less. Those young people who, who can still afford to attend a college or university are increasingly being deprived of a broad liberal arts education in which they have the opportunity to consider what life it is all about and what it might be and channeled instead into narrow vocational training programs that prepare them for corporate employment. This June, in fact, I, I received an appeal from the American Association of University Professors calling for the uh, protection of liberal arts in higher education. Why? Well, politicians like Governor Rick Scott of Florida have proposed singling out liberal arts majors, students he uh, apparently considers particularly unworthy of a uh, public education, and charging them higher uh, tuition than other students at public uh, uh, universities in, in Florida. Uh, Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin has proposed dropping the, the uh, goals of search for truth and improve the human condition from the University of Wisconsin's mission statement and substituting for them meet the state's workforce needs. In, in this context, the AAUP concluded, quote, we strongly believe that education is much more than narrow vocational training. Also, many students find that they are taught in vast lecture halls and have little or no access to faculty members with whom they can discuss their coursework, interesting books or ideas, scholarly disciplines, or the possibilities of attending graduate or professional school. As adjunct faculty are little more than ev evanescent ghosts 
uh, flitting by on campus, there is little opportunity uh, to meet with them, if there is even a place to meet with them. And student contact with human beings will be uh, strictly limited in, in, the, in the future, as MOOCs, massive online open courses, are substituted for courses uh, still taught in classrooms. Classrooms that once gave students the opportunity for a face-to-face -face discussion with their teachers and other students. Furthermore, many of these MOOCs are being contracted out to private profit-making corporations. Of course, the, the business model for higher education is most advanced at America's for-profit colleges and universities. These private enterprise institutions, often owned by giant banks and investment firms, underwent a, a surge of growth that started in the 1970s and uh, probably reached its peak from 2007 to 2009, uh, uh, when they numbered nearly 1,000 and could boast uh, uh, about 2.4 million students. So we're, we're not talking about a, a small marginal group. We're, we're uh, talking about 1,000 a, a institutions that uh, by uh, 2009 enrolled 2.4 million students um, in their uh, profit-making institutions. Uh, enrolling large numbers of first-generation low-income students, they, they soon became notorious for uh, deceptive student recruitment practices, misleading claims uh, about program uh, credentials, high student debt and default rates, and inferior educational and employment outcomes. Uh, the largest of the uh, for-profit schools, the um, University of Phoenix, which claimed an enrollment of 600,000 students in, in 2010, incurred numerous government fines and financial settlements with its students who sued it for shady ad admissions and educational practices. By 2017, its en enrollment, uh, like um, um, that of its for-profit counterparts, had declined substantially. Nonetheless, it, it uh, continues operations uh, today with 95% of its faculty teaching part-time, adjuncts uh, uh, receiving uh, approximately $1,000 to $2,000 per course, and student debt totaling $35 billion, the highest in the United States. Corporate in investors in the for-profit university system can take heart at the election of Donald Trump, who himself ran a, a, a for-profit educational entity, Trump University, which ultimately cost Donald Trump $25 million, uh, $25 million to settle lawsuits over its fraudulent operations. Um, Betsy DeVos, his, his choice for U.S. Secretary of Education, uh, scrapped two Obama-era government regulations for the uh, for-profit education industry during her first months after taking office. The first of these uh, regulations uh, she got rid of uh, eliminated um, a, a cutoff in, in, in U.S. government funding to uh, programs that uh, perform poorly. And the second made it easier uh, for uh, students defrauded by uh, uh, for-profit schools uh, to wipe out their loans. Um, by the way, on a, an, an upbeat note, uh, just the other day, I, I think it was uh, two days ago, uh, a federal court judge said that uh, DeVos uh, didn't have the authority to uh, uh, strike down these Obama-era uh, regulations. So uh, those, those regulations are now in, in uh, limbo. Um, um, uh, DeVos also appointed a, a former administrator at a for-profit university, uh, DeVry University, a, 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 a school uh, previously heavily fined by the federal government for its uh, fraudulent practices to police fraud in higher education. Colleges and universities are, are not only being run in, in increasingly on a business model, but are going out of their way to serve U.S. corporate interests. As you folks in Wichita resign, uh, reside in, in the heart of the uh, Koch brothers' corporate empire, I, I hesitate to discuss their work in influencing American colleges and universities. 
but there's certainly many people here tonight who, who, who know more about that than I do. E even so, I cannot resist pointing out that these two brothers, with about $120 billion in uh, corporate wealth uh, between them, have for years been running a very extensive campaign to transform American higher e education into a mouthpiece for their right-wing ideas. According to an extensive report in the Chronicle of Higher Education, the funding operations of the Charles Koch Foundation alone spread to at least 443 campuses between 2010 and 2016. Although not all of these funding ventures uh, were renewed, this year the, the foundation's website reported that its funding occurred, quote, at, at more than uh, 300 colleges and universities uh, across the country. And that doesn't include the higher education funding uh, provided by David Koch, other members of the Koch family, and their network of very, very wealthy donors. Um, did that annual funding, which as early as, as 2014 stood at uh, $23.4 uh, million, and which is certainly far larger today, uh, come with conditions attached? You bet it did. These included a role in the hiring of faculty, opportunities to veto decisions uh, about the use of funding, influence over uh, curriculum, uh, certificate programs, majors and minors, control of, of, of graduate fellowships, secrecy, circumvention of, of, of faculty opposition, and a, a green light for the uh, political activity of Koch-funded faculty. Quote, I'm not doing anything I'm ashamed of, Charles Koch told Forbes, uh, a leading business magazine in 2015. Quote, you've got to change the hearts and, and minds of, of, of the people to understand what really makes society fairer. And it's not more of this government control. Indeed, the, the Koch brothers' funding of university centers, programs, faculty, and students it is very much in, in line with their right-wing values. Uh, Brian Hooks, the, the president of the Charles Koch Foundation and the executive director of the uh, Mercatus Center at George Mason University, uh, uh, George Mason being the uh, most heavily funded of the, of the Koch brothers' higher education operations, um, Hooks bragged uh, to the Koch's network conference in, in 2014 that his, his center had the uh, largest collection of free market faculty at any nation, uh, at any uh, university in, in the world. Quote, these guys are uh, producing research that, that, that groups in, in this network can rely on to advance economic freedom every single day. Uh, advancing economic freedom, of course, it is the right wing's warm and, and fuzzy way of referring to ending en environmental regulations, uh, cutting taxes for the rich, ending government uh, protection of consumers, women and, and workers, scrapping civil rights legislation, uh, eliminating the uh, progressive income tax, uh, Social Security, and Medicare, and a, and a host of, of other right-wing nostrums. Uh, the Kochs also in invested heavily in, in web-based uh, curricula, uh, featuring an anti-government, business-friendly approach. The, the Advantage, uh, as it's called, for example, uh, features economics videos explaining how uh, sweatshops are good for third world workers, uh, how the Environmental uh, Protection Agency is bad for the environment, and how the minimum wage uh, costs workers their jobs. Uh, a narrator in one Advantage uh, uh, video states, quote, uh, the minimum wage is, is supposed to help the poorer, less skilled, and younger workers in the economy, but it doesn't. It gets them fired. Uh, naturally, the, the sharp ideological tone of, of the Koch brothers' venture in, in higher education and its sidestepping of, of, of uh, faculty governance led to controversies and scandals on numerous campuses, including those of Florida State University, Auburn University, Clemson University, Utah State University, uh, University of Louisville, West Carolina University, West Virginia University, University of Kentucky, Ball State University, 
University of Kansas, uh, Florida Gulf Coast University, Troy University, Texas Tech U University, Syracuse University, Michigan State University, Montana State University, and George Mason University. Thanks to campus and uh, public scrutiny, some colleges and universities have ended their association with Koch Brothers funding. But uh, this venture in, in corporate indoctrination continues on hundreds of American campuses. Uh, lest you think I am swayed here by uh, political partisanship, let me uh, provide you with further examples of attempts to use higher ed education to further uh, corporate priorities. Uh, these by the Democratic governor of, of New York State, Andrew Cuomo. In the spring of 2013, uh, Governor Cuomo, joined by businessmen, politicians, and top SUNY ad administrators, embarked on a, on a widely publicized barnstorming campaign to get the state legislature to adopt a, to, to adopt a plan he called Tax-Free New York. Under its uh, provisions, most of the 64 campuses of the State University of New York, portions of the City University of New York, and zones adjacent to SUNY campuses would be thrown open to private, profit-making businesses that would be exempt from state and local taxes on sales, property, the income of their owners, and the income of, of, of their employees uh, for a, a period of 10 years. Tax-free New York, uh, Cuomo announced, was, quote, a game-changing initiative that will transform SUNY campuses and university uh, communities across the state. Uh, according to the governor, this, this program would, as he said, supercharge the uh, state's e economy and bring job uh, creation to an unprecedented level. Uh, conceding that these tax-free zones wouldn't work without what he called a, a, a dramatic, quote, culture shift in the SUNY system, uh, Cuomo argued that faculty would have to, quote, get interested and participate in entrepreneurial activities. As he declared in mid-May 2013, the, the uh, uh, situation was, quote, delicate because academics are academics, but you'd be a better academic if you were actually entrepreneurial. Tax-free New York was only one component of, uh, of a drive uh, by the governor uh, and Nancy Zimfer, the uh, SUNY chancellor at, at that time, to uh, create a, a business-oriented university system. Uh, among other things, uh, New York State's new SUNY uh, 2020 program uh, provided for a $165 million uh, emergency technology and entrepreneurship complex on the SUNY Albany campus and encourage the, the hiring of faculty on the basis of their availability to fund them themselves through outside income. Uh, a nice way to deal with your faculty, right? Say, you know, we'll, we'll uh, put you on the faculty, but you're going to have to get your pay from uh, some other source, like your entrepreneurship uh, activities. Uh, additionally, uh, Cuomo established the uh, SUNY Networks of, of Excellence, uh, designed as a uh, SUNY Al Albany press release noted, quote, to foster entrepreneurialism and e economic growth through public-private partnerships and give researchers the tools they need to bring their ideas to market. Uh, the governor noted that the SUNY program would, quote, draw new venture capital to, to invest in commercialization activities and, and will help bring our best ideas to market right here in New York State. Uh, despite uh, criticism of tax-free New York by educators, unions, and even some conservatives, uh, local officials fell into line, uh, reluctant to, to challenge the, the, the state's governor, and uh, opposed this widely uh, touted jobs creation measure. The uh, uh, state legislature uh, established the, the program uh, renamed Startup New York, and including some private college campuses, in June 2013. After that, Startup New York moved into high gear. Hundreds of tax-free zones were established at New York colleges and universities, most of them on, on SUNY campuses, with numerous administrators hired to oversee the development of the new uh, commercial programs. Uh, new York State launched a very expensive 
uh, Startup New York TV advertising campaign in all 50 states of the nation, which, with ads focused on the theme, quote, New York, open for business. Uh, Chancellor Zimfer crowed, quote, nowhere in the country do new businesses stand to benefit more by partnering with higher ed education than in New York State, thanks to the widespread success of Governor Cuomo's Startup New York program. With interest and investment coming in from around the, the globe and new jobs being uh, created in every region, Startup New York has provided a spark for our e economy and for SUNY. Um, this was, uh, she declared, a, quote, transformative initiative. Although uh, uh, no one seems to know, or at least has revealed, uh, just how much uh, Startup New York actually cost New York State taxpayers, it was quite expensive. Uh, back in uh, 2013, uh, Governor uh, Cuomo's budget office estimated that it would cost uh, $323 million over the next three years. This figure did not include the, the uh, lost tax revenues to uh, locality, uh, uh, localities. This would simply be the uh, state government's uh, expenditures. In, in fairness, that uh, $323 million e estimate might well have been an overestimate for uneasy state legislators, uh, appalled by the uh, $53 million spent in, in the early ad campaign, for significant cutbacks in the uh, program's later advertising budget. Even so, when one adds up advertising costs, administrative costs, and non-payment non of business income, sales, and uh, property taxes, uh, Startup New York might well ha have cost uh, New York taxpayers uh, roughly uh, $300 million. Meanwhile, Governor uh, Cuomo championed another business education partnership, SUNY Polytechnic Institute. It grew out of the SUNY College of, of Nanoscale Science and Engineering, the brainchild of Elaine Calieros, a, a flamboyant SUNY Albany physicist who developed it in, into a, a $1 billion investment by New York State that morphed in, into a vast corporate enterprise with more than uh, $20 billion in investment from over 300 corporations. Uh, along the way, uh, Calieros be became the highest paid public official in the state of New York, uh, raking in $1.3 million in uh, uh, SUNY payments during 2013 alone. Naturally, when the Nanotech College merged with the SUNY Institute of, of Technology to form SUNY Poly, uh, Calieros became its, its president. Although SUNY Poly had remarkably few students, uh, perhaps 400 on its vast new Auburn campus, it had thousands of em employees working to serve the interests of these uh, 300 corporations. Uh, some of them the largest in the nation. Uh, Governor uh, Cuomo, enthralled by this thriving public partnership, made Calieros his top advisor on higher education and, and gave him the green light to uh, create such SUNY partnerships elsewhere. The first Nano uh, Utica was uh, announced in October 2013 and involved a uh, $200 million state investment in a computer ch a chip manufacturing and research center uh, to be run by uh, Calieros' uh, uh, Nanotech College and the and SUNY Institute of Technology. Uh, announcing the, the, the venture, the governor declared um, that, quote, this partnership demonstrates how the new New York is making targeted investments to uh, transition our state's economy to the 21st century and to take advantage of, uh, of the strengths of our world-class universities. O only a, a few days later, the news broke in the Albany Times Union, a uh, major newspaper in Albany, um, that, quote, the nanotech, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the nanotech college has been uh, aggressively uh, acquiring uh, real estate property from Albany to Rochester and was quietly seeking developers for a, a similar a chip manufacturing facility in, in Syracuse. Amid talk of billions of dollars in, in, in private investment, the article noted delicately that the Syracuse venture, quote, uh, would likely need an educational component to uh, fit in with a, a Cuomo strategy of using the, the, the SUNY system to, to attract 
um, uh, high-tech employers. Um, local campus ad ad administrators were uh, quick to, to jump on the bandwagon. In, in, in an article titled SUNY Cortland's Entrepreneurial Spirit, uh, published in the, in the summer of 2013 issue of the uh, SUNY Cortland Alumni Magazine, the, the uh, president of, of that SUNY college uh, declared that his school was, quote, taking steps to make sure our, our campus culture nurtures the spirit of entrepreneurism, one of the primary uh, strategic goals of the SUNY system. Quote, our, our graduates have, have built companies, restaurants, and theme parks, he, he boasted, and, and own chain franchises, run mom and pop businesses, and open health, wellness, and, and, and fitness related enterprises. Uh, furthermore, he added, quote, uh, business economics is now one of our most popular and fastest growing majors. But the college has an active entrepreneurship club, and it, it recently began offering a two course sequence in entrepreneurism. Other SUNY campuses were not far behind. In, in the fall of 2013, SUNY Albany, my campus, hired an associate vice president for business partnerships and economic development to manage and advance public-private partnerships at the university, including the emerging technology and entrepreneurship complex and the Startup New York program. Even before that, the dean of, of, of the College of Arts and Sciences, my dean, uh, called a, a special meeting of department chairs to hear a uh, presentation about Startup New York by the campus president's chief of staff and to address such questions as, quote, what kinds of businesses could your faculty potentially foster? Where would these businesses be located? And uh, what did all this activity around uh, New York's business education partnerships uh, produce? According to the official state figures, Startup New York added a grand total of 1,135 jobs to the state's workforce over a, a period of three years by the end of 2016. Although that might strike you as a remarkably small increase in the state's total workforce of over 9 million, it's actually an inflated figure. Many of these jobs were not, not really new ones at all, for most of them came from companies already operating in New York State. Indeed, uh, many of the companies simply moved their operations to a different region in the state to avail themselves of uh, Startup New York's tax breaks. <coughs> um, private companies did not, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, private companies did pay rent uh, for the use of, of SUNY buildings and labs. But of course this meant that SUNY students were deprived of the opportunity to use these facilities and were crowded into other spaces on their campuses. Uh, perhaps because uh, a Startup New York uh, produced um, uh, such meager benefits it seems to have mysteriously disappeared, and no further state funding uh, has been appropriated, and its remaining operations have been folded, have been folded in, into another program with a different name. So if you look for uh, Startup New York uh, in, in New York State, uh, you simply wouldn't find it anymore, and this uh, transformative uh, initiative went uh, pretty much nowhere. Um, the rosy glow has also vanished from SUNY Poly. In September 2016, after a lengthy investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, the Wheeler Dealer founder and CEO of his business education partnership, uh, Elaine Calieros, was arrested, as were uh, developers in, in Syracuse and, and Buffalo, in an extensive uh, corruption case. Uh, two months ago, a, a, a federal jury convicted Calieros, uh, along with uh, three, three uh, contractors, uh, of rigging the bids for state-funded contracts worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, Calieros will uh, not be sentenced until this October, so I couldn't tell you what sentence he will get, but he faces up to 60 years in prison for wire fraud and conspiracy. Although uh, SUNY Poly continues its operations, it has been badly tarnished by the scandal, as you might guess. It's, it's, it's president getting uh, a, a, a potential 60-year uh, sentence for, for fraud. Um, 
and it, it has lost um, several of its high-profile uh, programs, as well as a number of top scientists and engineers. Uh, a major corporation uh, uh, recently uh, pulled out abruptly uh, uh, from its uh, chip factory deal, terminating its employment uh, of most of its rented uh, SUNY poly scientists and engineers, uh, some of whom were re-employed by SUNY poly, uh, while others were simply dismissed without severance pay. So it goes when you're part of the uh, business education partnership. Uh, and so, uh, there we have it. Higher education operating increasingly like a profit-driven enterprise, and even uh, brazenly uh, promoting a corporate agenda. I guess I'm an old-fashioned believer in the Enlightenment, but I, I always thought that colleges and universities existed to further the pursuit of knowledge, knowledge that hopefully would help to uh, create a better world. It's against that backdrop the struggle between commercial values and the pursuit of, of knowledge that I wrote uh, What's Going On at UARDVARC. Uh, looking back on it, I think that by using satire uh, to write about the, the uh, corruption of higher education, I might have been escapist, avoiding the more painful alternative of telling the, the, the story in the form of nonfiction, as I've done tonight. However, it's also true that, that a satire uh, might reach people more easily than would a grim historical account. And who knows uh, what's going on at UARDVARC, which culminates in a successful rebellion against university corporatization, might even help spark a widespread revolt against higher education's corporate future. I would love to write a history of that. Thank you.